Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, always ladies before gentlemen, always boys before girls. This is the program on constitutional government, and our <laughs> speaker today is Diana Schaub. Diana Schaub is, um, is a professor of political science at Loyola University in Maryland, um, and she has a number of other uh, <laughs> designations, which I will, uh, some of which I'll, I will give to you. She's a contributing editor to uh, the magazine New Atlantis. She's been a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. She's a recipient of the Richard M. Weaver Prize for Scholarly Letters. Um, from 2004 to 2009, she was on the President's Committee on Council on Bioethics. And she's the author of uh, Erotic Liberalism, Women and Revolution in Montesquieu's Persian Letters, so the so study of the Persian Letters. And along with a number of book chapters and articles in the field of political philosophy and American political thought. And she's a co-editor with the Casses, uh, Amy <coughs> and Leon Cass, of What So Proudly We Hail the American Soul in Story, Speech, and Song. This came out in 2011. Um, she's appeared in uh, journals and magazines, National Affairs, The New Criterion, The Public Interest, The American Enterprise, the Claremont Review of Books, Commentary, First Things, American Interest, City Journal, anything else? <laughs> yeah. I, I sum it up, this, this woman is a beacon of intelligent patriotism. <laughs> and uh, she, she was also a postdoctoral fellow in our program on constitutional government here at Harvard, and she's taught elsewhere. She got her BA from Kenyon College in the metropolis of Gambia, Ohio. And um, she got her PhD in, um, at the University of Chicago, a somewhat bigger place. And she's going to talk on Abraham Lincoln and the Daughters of Dred Scott. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, I, I think the uh, poster that was put up said I was going to talk about Lincoln on discoveries and inventions. Uh, I am working on that speech, but it's not quite ready. So instead, I'm going to talk about Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's Dred Scott speech. Uh, and so your comments about gender are apropos. This is the speech in which uh, Lincoln really pays attention to the woman question. Uh, in his post-war assessment of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass made the case that Lincoln's statesmanship during the war hinged on his symbiotic relationship with Northern public opinion. Uh, according to Douglass, the primary and essential condition for Lincoln's twin accomplishments of union and abolition was the earnest sympathy and powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Uh, Douglas himself, Frederick Douglass, was all too aware of the deficiencies of that public opinion, especially as viewed from the genuine <coughs> abolition ground, which was the ground that Frederick Douglass always occupied. Uh, to the extent that Lincoln accommodated himself to the prejudices common to his countrymen towards the colored race, he appeared to Frederick Douglass and his friends as tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. However, Douglas also indicated that democratic statesmen ought to be evaluated by a quite different standard, measuring him by the sentiment of his country, Douglas says, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult. Lincoln was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. So on Douglas's mature understanding, Lincoln's relationship to public opinion was equal parts accommodation and transformation, with a judicious accommodation of white prejudice actually serving as the indispensable pathway to society-wide transformation. Lincoln understood that majority white opinion regarding blacks, uh, what he called the public estimate of the Negro, placed very severe constraints on anti-slavery possibilities. Uh, many white Americans were sincerely opposed to slavery, but they were racist at the same time. Uh, as a result, the good effects that might flow from their anti-slavery sentiments were being stymied by the ill effects of their invidious prejudices. They were reluctant to take the actions that might bring an end to slavery if that also meant extending full political and social equality to blacks. So that was the Gordian knot, the entanglement of race and slavery uh, that Lincoln had to find a way to slice through. Uh, and I think much of his rhetoric throughout the 1850s is designed to shift his white audiences away from their anti-black sentiment by eliciting what he believes to be a natural and universal sentiment against slavery. 
a sentiment that could be strengthened and confirmed by a proper understanding of the nation's founding principles. Now, with the Dred Scott decision of 1857, the difficulty of making this shift that Lincoln wanted his audiences to make, um, that, that, that shift that increased uh, significantly, the difficulty of making that shift. Uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney had made a mockery of his own professed commitment to originalism by claiming that at the time of the founding, quote, the black race were never thought of or spoken of except as property. Judge Curtis, in his dissent in the case, exposed Tawney's egregious errors of fact, meticulously citing chapter and verse from the state constitutions to prove that free blacks had been not only citizens, but fully enfranchised voters in a number of states in the early years of the republic. So how did Tawney manage to retroactively strip these voters of their participation in We the People? Well, Tawney did it by basing himself on the state of public opinion during the founding period, which he characterized or mischaracterized as uniformly hostile to blacks. But the only legislative evidence that he offered to show that blacks were, quote, regarded as beings of an inferior order, were two laws from the early 1700s relating to intermarriage between Negroes, mulattoes, and whites. Now, it seems a decidedly strange choice since the existence of laws punishing those who enter into such marriages seems to indicate that the line separating the races was not quite as bright as Tawny claims. Uh, clearly, there were whites who did not find all members of the African race altogether unfit to associate with, and even some who were willing to risk the punishment of seven years' servitude for marrying across racial lines. Now, it's not that Tawney is wrong, uh, or entirely wrong. I mean, there were persistent legislative attempts to affix a stigma to blackness and to erect barriers between the races. However, his purpose in citing these and only these particular laws relating to sexual conduct, uh, sexual contact, seems less a matter of historical accuracy than an underhanded way of triggering the contemporary fear of what was called amalgamation. Uh, this is a kind of ugly pseudoscientific term for race mixing and integration. Uh, the term emerged in the 1820s. Uh, later in the 1860s, after the Emancipation Proclamation, you get a new term, uh, miscegenation. Uh, but at this point, the term is amalgamation. Uh, the abolitionists were routinely denounced as amalgamationists. Now, if Tawney had been interested in a more accurate survey of the status of blacks under colonial and revolutionary era law, he would have taken note of the jarring contradictions and the amb ambivalences in their position. Yes, black slaves were classed as property, but they were also regularly classed as persons under the law, uh, and of course are clearly named as persons in the Constitution. Uh, I was browsing in the uh, Harvard bookstore uh, just this morning and came across a uh, Louisiana law requiring that all slaves possess names. <laughs> I mean, that really captures the ambivalence, doesn't it? Yes, a slave, but required to have a name, uh, recognized as persons. Uh, now, just a few weeks after Tawney's opinion was released to the public, Stephen Douglas, um, Remember, Stephen Douglas with one S, not to be confused with Frederick Douglass with two S's, uh, steep grounds for failing uh, the final exam if you mix those two up. Uh, uh, Stephen Douglas is uh, Lincoln's Democratic rival for the Illinois Senate seat in 1858 uh, and then for the presidency in 1860. So right after Taney's uh, uh, Dred Scott decision is released, Stephen Douglas delivers remarks on Kansas, Utah, and the Dred Scott decision. He's delighted to follow Taney's lead. Indeed, he makes this focus on amalgamation even more explicit, and he makes it more virulently racist. He asserts that, quote, amalgamation is degrading, demoralizing disease and death. Uh, he argues that the aim of our revolutionary fathers was to, quote, preserve the purity of the white race and to prevent any species of amalgamation, political, social, or domestic. Now, tellingly, it is the domestic possibility that most alarms him. According to Douglas, quote, our fathers did not regard the Negro race as any kin to them and determined so to lay the foundations of society and government that they should never be of any kin to their posterity. Douglas goes so far as to imply that the reason for Tawney's decision was actually to prevent 
that outcome, that amalgamationist outcome. By denying any possibility of black citizenship, the court saves white men, who are, after all, men of principle, from ever having to, quote, authorize Negroes to marry white women on an equality with white men. So in drafting his response to both Tawney and Stephen Douglas, Lincoln is very aware of what he is up against. Uh, amalgamation had been either the central topic or the pervasive subtext uh, in the remarks of both Tawney and Douglas. So not surprisingly, uh, I think his Dred Scott speech is the speech in which Lincoln most directly addresses the public estimate of the Negro, both in the founding era and in his own time. The speech contains two distinct discussions of amalgamation, discussions that create a frame or a kind of sandwich uh, for his most extensive explication of the meaning of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, yet another significant feature of Lincoln's speech is that women are featured throughout. Uh, it's quite a daring speech. Uh, it talks about polygamy, it talks about concubinage, it talks about rape. Uh, interestingly, though, it almost entirely avoids mention of white women or black men. Lincoln's rhetorical jujitsu involves a unique focus on black women and black girls. Lincoln's main purpose in the speech is to correct a dangerous misreading of the Declaration, uh, a reading that is being put forth by his Democratic opponents. Lincoln's generation, no less than our own, struggled to make sense of the stark contrast between the Declaration's ringing endorsement of human equality and the ongoing existence of chattel slavery. No one, at least in that era, wanted to denounce the founders as hypocrites. Today, of course, there isn't quite so much compunction on this score. Uh, one way to rescue the founders from the charge uh, that they said one thing and did the opposite was very simply to read blacks out of the Declaration. And this is what both Tawney and Douglas did. Here's what Douglas says. Can any sane man believe that the signers of the Declaration of Independence intended to place the Negro race on an equal footing with the white race? If such had been their purpose, would they not have abolished slavery? and converted every Negro into a citizen on the day on which they put forth the Declaration of Independence. No one can vindicate the character, motives, and conduct of the signers except upon the hypothesis that they referred to the white race alone and not to the African when they declared all men to have been created equal. Tawney reasoned similarly. He declared that the framers were great men and as such, incapable of asserting principles inconsistent with those on which they were acting. Now, I think Lincoln is no less interested in vindicating the founders, but he doesn't take this easy, self-congratulatory route. Uh, Lincoln rejects the white supremacist reading of the Declaration as nonsensical. He says it does obvious violence to the plain, unmistakable language of the Declaration, which is the language of inclusion, not the language of exclusion. At the same time, Lincoln honestly acknowledges the distance, the, 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 the chasm between the, the, the founders' theoretical principles and their political practice. But he didn't think that the gap between words and deeds made them hypocrites. Lincoln reminded his audience that democratic statesmen, constrained as they always are by tradition and by public opinion, are not free to place folks, whether white or black, instantly on a footing of full equality. Now that limitation does not mean that the words are meaningless or empty platitudes. Uh, properly understood, they vitalize and guide political life. So uh, let me just read the famous central passage from this speech. Uh, this is what's often called the standard maxim passage. Uh, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not intend to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say that all were equal in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity. They defined with tolerable distinctness in what respects they did consider all men created equal, equal in certain inalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. This they said, and this meant. They did not mean to assert the obvious untruth that all were then actually enjoying that equality, nor yet that they were about to confer it immediately upon them 
in fact, they had no power to confer such a boon. They meant simply to declare the right so that the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. They meant to set up a standard maxim for free society which should be familiar to all, revered by all, constantly looked to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and deepening its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. So according to Lincoln, Human beings are equal, but they aren't equal every which way. They're equal only in a highly specific way. Before specifying that way, however, Lincoln details the manifold ways in which humans are unlike one another. He says they're not the same in color, size, intellect, moral developments, or social capacity. I think that's a really intriguing list, uh, and I think a little reflection on it shows how carefully constructed it is. It ascends from simpler physical differences, like color and size, which I would submit have some relation to the categories we call race and gender. Uh, instead of saying race and gender, Lincoln says color and size. Uh, and then moves to more complex, multi-dimensional differences, intellect, moral developments, social capacity. Uh, it aims to be comprehensive, to capture the tremendous variety of humanity, its diversity in appearance, in faculties, in character, and circumstance. The list also hints at a difficult question, which Lincoln does not answer at this point. Uh, what account, if any, must be taken of these inequalities in a just political system? For present purposes, I want to concentrate just on the first category. I have another essay that's already been published that talks about all five of those categories uh, in more detail, but let's take the first one, color. Given that Lincoln's dispute with Tawney and Douglas concerned the founding era's view of black people, it isn't surprising that Lincoln begins by acknowledging a difference that presents itself to all eyes. Human beings don't look the same. They come in different colors. In the speech that Stephen Douglas had given, he spoke repeatedly of the African race and other inferior races. He spoke of the superior white race. Tawney had done the same. He referred to Negroes of the African race, the enslaved African race, always in juxtaposition to the dominant race, that is, the white race. Lincoln, by contrast, rarely utters the word race. He does so sometimes, usually in the context of talking about someone else's remarks or characterization. Instead of dividing human beings into fixed categories, Lincoln presents the difference between blacks and whites as a purely superficial difference of skin tone. It's a matter of color. Uh, in other writings, he points out that skin tone is not actually binary. Right? There really is no black and white. It's a matter of degree. It's lighter and darker. And in, the, in that other writing, that fragment, uh, he warns slaveholders that if they regard whiteness as a title to mastery, they can't escape the logical conclusion that they themselves should be enslaved to the first person who comes along with a paler skin than their own. So by speaking of color rather than race, Lincoln suggests the existence of a spectrum, right? infinite gradations. Uh, he highlights the visible difference of color within what he calls the whole human family, but he hints at the individual rather than the class character of those differences. So he bridges the racial divide with a rainbow uh, such that by the end of the passage, he's able to envision all people of all colors everywhere enjoying the benefits of free society. So he acknowledges the scope of differences among human beings, and then he returns to this matter of our essential similarity. What's the precise respect in which human beings are alike? He quotes directly from the Declaration, we possess inalienable rights, uh, which is to say rights be that belong to us by virtue of the kind of creature we are. According to Lincoln, there shouldn't be so much confusion about the meaning of equality. Equality is not some vague generality. Quite the contrary, the Declaration offers a definition. Equality, as Lincoln reads it, equality means equality with respect to natural rights. So none of those significant differences among human beings, which Lincoln went to the trouble of listing, uh, 
And I think he knows that maybe those differences loom larger than they ought to in the minds of his audience. None of those significant differences invalidates the equal entitlement to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So rights are not contingent on anything other than membership in what Lincoln calls the human family. And the phrase, by the way, human family, I think is a direct riposte uh, to Stephen Douglas, who had insisted that, quote, our fathers did not regard the Negro race as any kin to them. Lincoln's next step in the analysis of the Declaration is crucial, I think, to his vindication of the revolutionary generation. He considers again what the authors did not intend to say. This is so interesting, that passage. He spent so much time on what, on what they didn't mean. Right? Um, they were deadly serious about the truth of human equality, but they knew full well that not all were actually enjoying that equality. Indeed, by their own assessment, they themselves were not enjoying equal rights. That's why they write the Declaration, to present to the world the evidence uh, of their oppression as a justification for their independence from Great Britain. So by focusing on what the founders did not mean to say, Lincoln reminds his audience of how insecure rights are, how often they are violated. Most people in most times and most places have not enjoyed the equality to which they are entitled. What did the authors of the Declaration propose to do about this nearly universal disrespect for the rights of man? According to Lincoln, they had no power. They had no power to set the world immediately to rights. Indeed, it was pretty unclear whether the colonists would have sufficient power to reclaim their own usurped rights, much less anyone else's. So I think what Lincoln does here is sort of dash any kind of utopian hopes about perfect equality. But then he concludes with two ringing sentences stating what the founders did mean. They declared the right. By doing so, they generated the expectation that the enforcement would follow ASAP, right. which is to say as speedily as prudence permits. Whereas the Declaration of Right is universal and absolute, the enforcement of right is dependent on circumstances. So to take the case of black slavery by the premises of the Declaration, it's undeniable that black persons are uh, possessed of a natural right to liberty. It's being wrongfully denied by the practices of the colonists. The rectification of that injustice was neither quick nor easy. It took a civil war, it took 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, and a long, torturous process of societal reconstruction that stretches over the next century and into our own. Uh, but what I want to stress is that for Lincoln, the Declaration of Right in 1776 was epoch-making. It establishes a lodestar, it establishes that standard maxim uh, that guides incremental improvement. Without that clearly articulated standard, there is no pressure for reform. Uh, so this is a new thing. It's a government that has within itself the principle of its own self-correction. Fidelity to the origins, fidelity to the point of reverence, Lincoln's always talking about reverence. Right? Fidelity to the point of reverence is what becomes the engine of perpetual progress. It's a very interesting mix of kind of liberalism and conservatism. Um, according to Lincoln, the spread of equal liberty is not limited to the United States. Right? The, U uh, the Declaration will be global in its reach. Uh, not because the U.S. is going to go around imposing regime change by force, but because awareness of the foundations of free society moves human beings longingly towards it. Knowledge of the truth, that it be familiar to all, produces attachment to the truth, that it be revered by all, which in turn produces action on behalf of the truth, that it be constantly labored for. So I think for good reason this standard maxim passage uh, is often quoted by admirers of Lincoln. However, to grasp how he readies his audience to receive this message, uh, I think it's necessary to pay attention to these other passages in the speech, which I would consider ground-clearing passages. Uh, most of these are directed against Douglas. There's one, uh, one section directed against Tawney. Uh, According to Lincoln, the Chief Justice had assumed that the public estimate of the black man is more favorable now, in the 1850s, than in the time of the Revolution. 
To prove this assumption grossly incorrect, uh, Lincoln details concrete changes which illustrate a recent hardening of opinion against blacks. He cites sort of it's become more difficult to emancipate people. Uh, you know, laws have changed in ways that indicate this hardening of sentiment against blacks. Uh, to such an extent that now you have uh, explicit attacks upon the principles of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Declaration being called a self-evident lie rather than self-evident truth. Um, towards Tawney, uh, I mean, Lincoln is harsh, uh, but sort of respectful. Um, he speaks more impersonally. The polemic against Douglas is different, and when he shifts to him, uh, it's full of sort of satiric sallies. Uh, he skewers his character, Douglas's character, along with his policy positions. Uh, Lincoln starts, in his attack on Douglas, starts with the situation in the Utah Territory where the Mormons uh, were actually engaged in a rebellion, taking up arms against the US government. Lincoln does not spend very much time on the practical question about what to do in Utah. He shifts the discussion to this underlying moral question of polygamy. Remember, at the time, plural marriage is not just uh, something a few uh, renegade Mormons are engaged in. It's the official position of the Mormon church. Uh, one third of Mormon women are in polygamous marriages. The Republican platform of 1856 singled out not just slavery, but polygamy, and linked polygamy and slavery together, called them the twin relics of barbarism, uh, called upon Congress to prohibit both practices in the territories. Uh, so what Lincoln tries to do, he tries to force his political opponent, Stephen Douglas, to take a position on the morality or the immorality of polygamy. Remember, Douglas is resolutely refusing to do this with respect to slavery. He professes not to care whether the people in the territories vote to have slavery or vote to uh, uh, prohibit slavery. Uh, this is Douglas's policy of popular sovereignty, right? Uh, residents of the territories are supposed to be left up to them. They had a sacred right to decide all matters for themselves on the basis of local majority rule. And Douglas says, I don't care how they, you know, how they vote. It's, it's just procedural. That's what democracy means. You have a procedural right to, to make whatever decision you like, right of the majority. So what, Douglas, what Lincoln is doing is testing the limits of Douglas's view that majorities, majorities composed of white males, can do whatever they like, whether it be to keep a stable of black men as slave labor or a stable of white women as sex slaves. He's trying to puncture Douglas's stance of non-judgmentalism, Douglas's official position of moral neutrality. While Douglas can perhaps get away with saying he doesn't care one way or the other about slavery, because remember, the nation is about evenly divided uh, on that issue, but he cannot adopt that strategy with respect to Mormon polygamy, uh, because polygamy had triggered vehement public outrage. Uh, remember, the reason the Mormons are way the heck out there in Utah is because they've been chased out of every other community they tried to uh, you know, uh, settle in. So Lincoln pressures Douglas on the, on the polygamy issue, uh, and then he turns to another controversial form of sexual union. Just about the only thing that Stephen Douglas did express moral disapproval of was any kind of intimate mixing between the races. When Republicans insisted that slavery was wrong and that all human beings had a natural right to liberty, Douglas argued that must mean the Republicans endorsed full social and political equality for blacks. Or, as he summarized it, if the Declaration of Independence applies to the African race, that would authorize Negroes to marry white women on an equality with black men. I'm sorry, sorry with white men. Authorize Negroes to marry white women on an equality with white men. Douglas did everything he could to stoke that white fear which is to say the white male fear of amalgamation, the fear that a daughter of theirs would bring home a Negro, the guess who's coming to dinner kind of fear. For those of you who still remember that, that movie, Sidney Poitier movie. Uh, female supporters of Douglas even embroidered their dresses with the slogan, white men or none. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, it, it, it really is good to read a few of the historians, you know, to, to understand sort of what the, what the public mood was like at this point and, and what Lincoln is really up against. So the first element in Lincoln's rejoinder is simply to expose the tactical nature of Douglas's racism. Uh, in other words, he calls him out for playing the race card. Uh, Douglas, he says, is trying to, slay, to, to save his floundering political career because he is getting a little pushback on popular sovereignty. Uh, he's he says he's trying to save his, his floundering political career by lugging in the idea of amalgamation and then trying to attach that idea to the Republicans. So in order to expose Douglas's trick, Lincoln has to make explicit the underlying public sentiment that Douglas is tapping into. And so Lincoln says... Quote, this is Lincoln now, there is a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of an indiscriminate amalgamation of the white and black races. Now a statement like this tends to provoke disgust in modern readers, uh, or at least to prompt doubts about the nature of Lincoln's own views on race. He says there's a natural disgust in the minds of nearly all whites at the idea of mixing. Whereas Douglas sought to brand Lincoln as a Negro lover in order to make Lincoln unelectable, we react to Lincoln's pushing away of that label by branding Lincoln as just another white supremacist. Before we join in that contemporary denunciation, however, I think we should note a few curious features of Lincoln's formulation. First, although he calls the disgust natural, he also indicates that not all whites share it. It's nearly all whites. Thus, it's possible that Lincoln counts himself among the non-disgusted minority. Second, he says the objection is to indiscriminate amalgamation. Now, you might wonder about the meaning of that qualifier. Would a more discriminating amalgamation for instance, maybe political equality, but not yet full social equality. Uh, would that be acceptable to more whites, maybe including Lincoln? We do know that by the end of the Civil War, Lincoln had come out in favor of a qualified suffrage for blacks uh, as a first step towards, uh, towards full political equality. Third, there's a further oddity in Lincoln's formulation. He attributes this natural disgust to <coughs> minds in reaction to an idea. Now this was not actually how the anti-amalgamationist folks talked about it, this sort of pseudo-scientific advance guard of, uh, of the anti-amalgamation movement. You had these ethnologists uh, like Josiah Clark Knott, uh, and they argued that white repugnance to mixing uh, was instinctual because the races, according to them, were actually different species, right? This was the beginning of this uh, suggestion of polygenesis, that we weren't, one, we weren't all of one blood, but there were separate creations. Uh, so I think Lincoln's formulation, by kind of saying that this is an idea uh, that, that one then reacts against, uh, gives no credence to those sort of pernicious uh, speculations. Finally, most importantly, we just can't forget that the reason Lincoln mentions white resistance to race mixing is because he's trying to neutralize the, the interference uh, that that idea uh, puts to the anti-slavery cause. So this paragraph in the, in the speech starts with a reference to the natural disgust of whites, but it ends with a reference to the natural right of blacks. Uh, it, it's amazing what he, what he does in one paragraph. In other words, he flips it. That's this sort of jujitsu that he does. He starts with natural disgust of whites, ends with natural rights of blacks. Uh, he can move from sort of acknowledging white prejudice, but then transforming and uh, transcending it. So how does he accomplish the move in this particular instance? Well, because of the inflamed state of public opinion, he has to find a way to reject Douglas's equation of abolition with amalgamation. So here's what Lincoln says. Now I protest against that counterfeit logic, which concludes that because I do not want a black woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. I need not have her for either. I can just leave her alone. In some respects, she's certainly not my equal. But in her natural right to eat the bread she earns with her own hands without asking leave of anyone else, she is my equal and the equal of all others. 
So note that Lincoln avoids any mention of the black man, white woman pairing, right? That's the surefire trigger for white anxiety. Instead, he speaks of a black woman, and he shows the illogic of Douglass's claim by making himself the illustrative example. Lincoln, me, I, I hate slavery, and yet I'm not seeking a black wife. By personalizing the issue, Lincoln manages to deny that he's any sort of advocate for intermarriage, but he does so without giving any credence to the overheated fears of the white racial imagination. His example skirts all of those nasty stereotypes about predatory black men. I think it's a very deft rhetorical move. He turns his disavowal of race mixing into an endorsement of the essential equality and independence of women. Uh, speaking of this hypothetical black woman, Lincoln says he need not have her as either a slave or a wife. He can just let her be, let her go about her business as a self-determining agent. Uh, now, again, I think that contemporary listeners might be put off by Lincoln saying that this woman is in some respects not his equal. I must say I'm not at all bothered by that. I don't regard myself or anyone I've ever met, maybe other than Harvey, <laughs> as Lincoln's equal. Right? Uh, except, of course, in the respect he mentions, that of having an equal natural right to enjoy the fruits of one's own labor. Having accorded this black woman equal respect, Lincoln moves immediately to his consideration of the meaning of the Declaration's Equality Clause, the passage that I spent, the standard maxim passage that I spent some time on earlier. So I think nothing could be clearer than that for Lincoln, all men includes not only black men, but all women as well, because his leading example of a person entitled to natural rights is a black woman. Directly after finishing his long commentary on the individual rights doctrine of the Declaration, Lincoln returns once more to this matter of race mixing. Since Stephen Douglas is frightening whites in the free states away from their belief in individual rights by hinting that black freedom would endanger the purity of white womanhood, Lincoln has to tack back again to address those concerns. Now, I think this is an admission of sorts that his earlier disavowal, because it was limited to a description of his own desires and his own behavior, that doesn't really fully meet the case. The issue is not whether Lincoln himself must engage in the ultimate social mixing, but whether someone with his views must allow others to do so. Uh, in other words, welcome a change in the laws with respect to intermarriage. His initial response is to say, agreed for once, a thousand times agreed, there are white men enough to marry all the white women, and black men enough to marry all the black women, and so let them be married. Like he's presiding over a mass <laughs> marriage or something, you know. Uh, Lincoln cheerfully, uh, even humorously, acknowledges that folks tend to stick to their own when it comes to marriage. His ready agreement, I think, has the effect of diffusing Douglas's attempt to stir up racial chauvinism. And then, Lincoln's argument takes a bold turn. Citing the available census statistics on the number and residence of mixed race individuals, Lincoln proves that the real cause of amalgamation, this thing that Douglas is so horrified by, the real cause is slavery. The problem isn't marriage between whites and free blacks. The problem is the rape of black women by white masters. Lincoln is well aware that slavery violates not only the rights to the fruits of one's labor, but the right to the integrity of one's body. He points out that where freedom exists, and especially where civic equality exists, mixed race unions are very rare. New Hampshire, he says, the state that goes the furthest towards equality between the races has the fewest mulattoes. I think it's a classic instance of Lincoln's brilliant redirection. He takes the white fear of race mixing and he shows how it ought to lead those who have the fear to endorse not only black freedom, but civic equality. 
or a greater degree of civic equality. Now, today, interracial marriage is no longer controversial. That welcome change can make it difficult, I think, to appreciate the strategy behind Lincoln's language. We expect all good people to be ostentatiously anti-racist. Okay. Now, I think you can make the case that Lincoln himself is free of racial prejudice, but he certainly does not make a big show of being morally outraged by racist views. He knows that attacking the core beliefs of one's audience doesn't generally win you any friends, and it makes it harder to win votes. So instead, through this cool, numerical analysis, Lincoln tries to persuade even racial bigots that they ought to rethink their policy preferences. He's willing to sort of exploit that, that racial chauvinism in order to further the anti-slavery cause. And I think to do so in such a way that the chauvinism itself is not, doesn't become petrified or reified, but it too is actually put in the direction of, of ultimate extinction. Now, the final step in the argument uh, involves a shift in tone. And I think it's as if he has now prepared his audience to hear a higher type of appeal. Uh, it, it really is, I mean, all of Lincoln's speeches do this. They, 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 they have a directionality to them. The, the arguments unfold and change as they go along. Uh, Lincoln reminds us that the Dred Scott case, in which the slave Dred Scott was suing for his freedom, involved not just a black man, but his wife and two daughters. With respect to this black family, Lincoln says, we desired the court to have held that they were citizens, so far at least as to entitle them to a hearing as to whether they were free or not, and then also that they were in fact and in law really free. Why did Lincoln care about Dred Scott, his wife, and two daughters? <coughs> what was at stake? Here's what Lincoln says. Could we have had our way the chances of these black girls ever mixing their blood with that of white people would have been diminished, at least to the extent that it could not have been without their consent. Lincoln enshrines the notion of consent, not only in the public political realm, but in the private sexual realm. Lincoln is not outraged by race mixing but by the violent and non-consensual aspect of such mixing as occurs inevitably under slavery. Lincoln contrasts his policy favoring black freedom with the effects of Douglas's endorsement of the Dred Scott decision. But Judge Douglas, he says, is delighted to have them decided to be slaves and not human enough to have a hearing and thus left subject to the forced concubinage of their masters and liable to become the mothers of mulattoes in spite of themselves. I find this to be a profoundly empathetic statement. Lincoln has managed to move his listeners from Douglas's horror at the thought of the mixing of blood by the white and black races to sympathy for the daughters of Dred Scott, now sent back to the real horrors of slavery. In place of those bigoted caricatures of black men, he encourages his male listeners, his white male listeners, to put themselves in the shoes of Dred Scott. Dred Scott, the father of vulnerable daughters. Daughters he will be powerless to protect from the depredations of the slave system. The argument has come full circle. Lincoln knows that his audience is repelled by polygamy. He has now shown that American slavery, at least for women, is often a form of polygamy, the worst kind of polygamy, forced concubinage. While not making any accusation against Dred Scott's master, Lincoln nonetheless indicates that, quote, a percentage of masters are inclined to exercise this particular power which they hold over their female slaves. At the close of the speech, Lincoln sums up the three planks of the Republican position, that the Negro is a man, that his bondage is cruelly wrong, and that the field of his oppression ought not to be enlarged. All three derive from his understanding of the Declaration, 
Throughout the decade of the 1850s, Lincoln used his oratorical powers to revive the American faith in human equality, and uniquely in the Dred Scott speech, he sought to strengthen the anti-slavery sentiments of his audience, sentiments that Lincoln believed lay at the very foundation of our sense of justice by his subtle focus on the fate of women. Lincoln manages to expand our human sympathies without sacrificing analytic rigor and without descending into either overt emotionalism or demagogic appeals to anger, uh, as so many of the abolitionist orators did. I think by studying Lincoln's speeches, we learn of the Declaration's timeless power, the ever-present need to understand it rightly, and not least, the possibility of persuasive political speech that enlightens and ennobles its listeners. If only our nation could be blessed with the likes of Lincoln again. Thanks. Yeah, Reggie. Um, it occurs to me that if we were living in the 1860s, Diana Schaub would not have the right to vote. Uh, as well as uh, suffer certain other limitations on her free use of her capacities. So uh, my first question is uh, is to ask, uh, uh, I guess I know that after 18, after that gathering of radical women in 1848 in upstate New York, that there certainly was in Lincoln's day uh, a movement toward full equality for women. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, did Lincoln and the new Republican Party uh, have an attitude toward this issue? And uh, I'll sling in another question. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, in your wonderful lecture, thank you, that Lincoln came out in favor but by the end of the Civil War, Lincoln came out in favor of a qualified suffrage for blacks. I'm wondering if you could, I'd be grateful if you could tell us just what was that, how qualified, yeah. how much of a uh, pro-equal rights for black folks was he in this regard? Yeah. Uh, on women, uh, Lincoln, in his uh, earliest declaration of candidacy, candidacy back in the 1830s as a young man, came out for the vote for women. So that's interesting, uh, but he doesn't seem to make an issue of it or push on it in any way, and I don't know of other statements after that, after that very early statement. Uh, so he certainly was not in the forefront of any sort of movement uh, for political equality for women. Uh, I, I think that that sort of that sort of fits. Yeah, that that sort of fits with his uh, with his caution on such issues. He waits till they become till they become an issue, till they sort of rise to significance. Uh, and of course, uh, as he sees the situation in the 1850s, it's not a matter of pushing forward on things like that. It's a matter of avoiding retrogression. Uh, if slavery spreads into the territories, then uh, it becomes a very different kind of union, a union no longer dedicated to the equality of all men. So I think he sees, I mean, in, in other words, his, his political attention is on, is on the crisis, the crisis of the house divided. Uh, with respect to the, the vote for, uh, for blacks, uh, before the war, uh, Lincoln's policy is the same policy that had been recommended by Jefferson and by Henry Clay, namely gradual emancipation plus expatriation or colonization. Not, not any sort of forced colonization, but uh, a voluntary repatriation of freed blacks. Uh, either to somewhere else in the New World or back to their homeland. Uh, he thought that that would be a comprehensive solution to the problem of American slavery. Uh, I, I think he's never all that enthusiastic that it will actually happen, but I think partly he thinks that the, by continuing to keep the possibility of colonization alive, it is a way to reconcile people to emancipation. 
Uh, once the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, he knows that colonization is off the table. He never mentions it again. He begins to think about what America will look like post-slavery with four million freed slaves. And uh, he begins to float the idea of a qualified suffrage. So in a letter to Michael Hahn, uh, remember Louisiana is retaken pretty early and there's going to be a new free state governor of Louisiana, and he writes him a letter. He says, just privately, for your, your consideration, uh, would it not be possible to uh, you know, consider the vote uh, at least for, uh, for the very intelligent and those who have fought in our ranks? So it might be some kind of qualified suffrage. There might be a literacy test, uh, but he certainly and but he really does stress those who those who have fought in our ranks. Remember, by the end of the war, one fifth of Union troops are African American. Uh, there are two hundred thousand African American men who fight in the Civil War. So. Uh, and by the way, this is exactly what Frederick Douglass had in mind. He thought it was absolutely essential that blacks participate in the war and participate in the acquisition of their own freedom. And he knew that that would then become the leverage for demanding uh, civil rights. Remember, there's a difference between a nat your natural right to freedom and whether you have a political right, a civil right, as a, as a participant in a particular political order. And so Frederick Douglass knew that a new kind of argument was going to be necessary. So it's very interesting to see Lincoln already pushing that pushing that forward. But again, his, his caution, I think he thinks it's safer to go with a qualified suffrage initially and build upon that. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to reconcile the defeated Southerners to this, to this new situation. Uh, although he, he puts it in a really interesting way in that letter to Michael Hahn. He says, uh, uh, if we did this, we could keep the, uh, the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. Okay, that's like, sounds really flowery and nice. I think what he means is, who are these new black voters going to vote for? Republicans. <laughs> right? We need Republicans in the South if Reconstruction has any chance of, of working. Keep the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for this paper. I, I, it takes a, I think, a really sensitive and acute reader to bring out Lincoln's brilliance, and you did that. Um, I'm just wondering if perhaps I could push you a little bit further on one of your interpretations. You talked about that sentence that, that Lincoln offers. There's a natural disgust yeah. in the minds of nearly all white people to the idea of indiscriminate amalgamation. Yeah. And then later on, you pose the question, which I think is a very good one, would a more, you know, what is a more discriminating amalgamation? And I'm wondering if you could read that adjective indiscriminate, yeah. meaning not marriage. In other words, marriage by definition yeah, he's, is discriminating. You, but not you, 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 yeah, you, yeah. you, you, you. So if that's what he means there, that's the natural disgust for all people for polygamy or for uh, promiscuity, for example, and not so much the, the mixing. Yeah, so in a way, I mean, he, 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 depending on the weight you put on that word, he said almost nothing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> By saying indiscriminate, everybody's opposed to indiscriminate right, exactly. motivation. We choose our friends. Yeah. Uh, we choose our social companions. We Which choose is our, our yeah. marital partners. Right. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that, that yeah, and, and that's, as much as it seems disgusting to us now actually encapsulizes your thesis. Yeah. It, it, it also shows how ca careful he is. <laughs> it did, yeah. And <laughs> seem to say something that maybe he's not, right. not, not quite saying. Uh, and that's why in the longer paper, which I guess was sent around to you guys, uh, I actually give like that passage from Du Bois and you know le leading black fi figures, including fairly radical black figures like Du Bois, who says, uh, yeah, everybody should object to indiscriminate amalgamation. Uh, and his version is, you know, you can take account of things like class. Uh, you don't have to mix with people you consider vulgar. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks so much for the time. No, it's very interesting. Um, I was wondering, so uh, you mentioned that Lincoln frequently speaks of reverence, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm very interested in the virtue of reverence, uh, and I think it's kind of a forgotten virtue 
it's seldom celebrated in modern life. In fact, we frequently praise irreverence. Um, and so, there's something about modernity, I think, that goes with praising irreverence. So, uh, so I think, as you rightly said, his, um, his praise for reverence speaks to this interesting kind of balance between conservatism and liberalism in his, in his thought and, and practice. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit. Um, like, what does he think? Uh, I believe you mentioned that he, he frequently speaks of reverence for the foundations of free government. Um, does he hold any, or, or I suppose, natural rights? Like, are there specific things that he points to as, <coughs> as, as legitimate objects of reverence yeah. that we should legitimately feel awestruck by or something? Yeah, that, yes. uh, I, I think I can tell you the speech that you should go to, okay, uh, right, right. and that's Lincoln's Lyceum Address, which he gives when he's very young. He's 29 years old, uh, and it is a speech about reverence and that recommends reverence actually as a solution to the problem at the moment. He gives this sort of diagnosis of the problems of, of, the, of the passions within free government and the leading to kind of mob rule and leading to uh, the spirit of disobedience and nullification. Uh, and he recommends in response to it a political religion of reverence for the law and the Constitution. So it, it's very interesting. At the, at the end of that speech, he, he sort of says, you know, uh, the founders were able to tap into passion, their own passion for fame and glory, and the passion that ordinary folks uh, had of, you know, sort of hatred towards the British. And passion served this very important role in the achievement of our revolution. But he says now, you know, that for, for the later generations, passion is our enemy. Uh, passion now becomes division. Uh, and he says, reason is our only hope, right? We sort of have to build new pillars, new props uh, for free government. Uh, in a way, he says, we really haven't yet proven whether free government is possible because we had those artificial props before, those, those props of the passions. Now we have to refound it sort of solely on, on the basis of reason. But it's very weird because he, he's, he has this great call for reason at the end, but in the middle of the speech he calls for reverence. And so it's unclear what reverence is or the, what is the relationship between reverence and, and reason. Uh, and it, it does seem to me that it, he regards reverence in a way as a, as a kind of rational passion. Right? Uh, and in the Lyceum Address he attaches that, says it should be attached to the Constitution and laws. Okay? By the era of the 1850s, as the crisis comes to a head, it's not that Lincoln is no longer a constitutionalist. I think he's always a constitutionalist. But he knows somehow that that is no longer adequate. And that's when he starts going to the Declaration instead. Uh, the problem has gotten so severe that we are now sort of acting in contravention of our of our fundamental principles. We're in fact repudiating our fundamental principles, and so it's it's not sufficient to call for you know the constitutional laws. You have to go back to the origin, and so all of those speeches from the 1850s contain these interpretations and appeals to the Declaration. So he's now sort of attaching that reverence to the to the Declaration. It speaks of our ancient my our ancient faith and. Things like that, which sounds more like a traditional um, PM for reverence, right? Appealing to tradition or the ancestral. Or yeah, except for for Lincoln, it's always it's it's rooted in a in a in a proposition in an in an idea, right? right? Um, something rational. Yeah, and, and something textual. You know, he's always going back to, to, to the text, to the fundamental text. Uh, I, I, I really do, you know, I suppose everybody's been to the Lincoln Memorial, but I mean, it gets it just right, right? Because when you go to the Jefferson, it's, it's, it's got all those little uh, one-liners, you know, from Jefferson. So there's text there, but it's, it's just the, you know, the highlights, those one-liners. <laughs> when you go to the Lincoln Memorial, there is the Gettysburg Address, the full text on one flanking wall and the second inaugural on the other, the full text. Right. Uh, now, of course, he made them compressed and short, you know, so they could fit up there on those, on those, <laughs> on those walls. But it, I mean, it, it seems to me to get it just right, and it's astonishing how many people they come in and they stand there and they read the entire thing. They stand there and they read the entire thing. I mean, he 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 did that on on purpose. I mean, he he, he came to have this kind of compression. Uh, of his of his of his speech, uh, so that they really could be memorized. Yeah. Uh, 
But on the other hand, he had the ability to give three hour speeches. Yeah, the, the, the Peoria address, I mean, stunning speech. Really, really stunning speech. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. I thought it was really wonderful. Just on this point about reverence, um, I think you put it quite rightly. He's, re he's attaching reverence to a proposition. So reverence is now for a form of government, for a set of ideas. Uh, it's a rational kind of reverence in a way. And in a sense, he's redefining the virtue because reverence yeah. is traditionally about gratitude. It, it's, it's a reflection of sort of, it, it's very different from, for instance, Socrates saying, I obey the laws because the laws raised me, right? It, it seems it's not about the intellectual merit of the laws. There is a kind of particularized gratitude that's almost parental in that expression of reverence. So I just wonder if you could, do you, do you make much of that redefinition of of yeah, I, I think that's nice, Demetrius. Um, yeah, he, he does this in other ways also. Remember, he's, he's steeped in the Bible, he's steeped in religion, but he's doing something with that. I mean, when he calls for a political religion of reverence, uh, yeah, he's taking a religious idea and repurposing it. Uh, you, you, you could maybe look to see whether he does something similar with the idea of charity in the second inaugural, right? Is the charity he speaks of there the same as Christian charity, or does it now look somewhat different? Um, that's not enough of an answer to you, but uh, I, I, I think it's, it's worth exploring what he's doing when he takes these terms like reverence and charity. And, and both of those are really important in Lincoln and applies them to the political order. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I suppose it also raises a question, um, you know, when Lincoln goes back to the, he's always going back to the declaration, right? Fidelity to the past, let's get back and see what that declaration really means. Uh, but in doing that, does he somehow then deepen our understanding of that text, or does he alter our understanding of that text? Uh, is, is Lincoln engaged just in fidelity to the, to the founding, or is he also engaged in a kind of refounding? And what do these ideas like reverence and charity uh, have to do with that, with that refounding? Um, it, Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it seems to me one could ask whether, whether Lincoln is not I introducing, well, I mean, maybe you see it in his understanding of self-government too, right? There, for, for Lincoln, there's no self-government if the individuals uh, in that order are not themselves self-governing. But that means he pays more attention to character and virtue, and maybe there's a little bit more of Aristotle that Lincoln is bringing into the... To the founding. Thanks again for the careful comments and reading. And I guess I wanted to ask about a different element in light of your, your invitation to read Lincoln from our own perspective today and what's going on today. Um, that you brought out very well that Lincoln and his defense of the principle of liberty versus slavery relies in this speech at least very much on the language of family, right? And so the, the family of mankind, mm -hmm. and also encouraging, as you said, it, very dramatically, his, his white male listeners to envision Dred Scott's daughters, well, as their own, right? To envision mm -hmm. the sense of right that they feel of it's not right to let men predate women, young women, this way. Um, that's a different sort of right, of course, than natural right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right? That, that men take care of women. Yeah, it's a different well, right. I don't take care of my daughter because she is an individual with natural rights, but for something more than that. And I wonder today, yeah. the language that's used in so-called debates of race relations, it's not so much about black women as much right now as black men. And yeah. saying that black men are bodily subject to violence 
but the appeal, at least as I've heard, I mean, that could be wrong, but is not defend them as your brothers, but rather, well, that, you know, people have a right to their, their own body and the, the, the property in themselves and they should not be stopped and searched and, and otherwise harmed. So I wonder if Lincoln's rhetoric and his appeal to family feeling or appeal to even male bias in terms of taking care of women, while very powerful, doesn't, doesn't it ultimately, isn't it ultimately undermined uh, by I, the appeal to natural right? No, this is a, a, I, I like the question, but I'm, uh, I actually, I mean, it's interesting what you say about use of sort of family and stuff, but I don't think he's presenting or, or telling men that they own these women or oh, that they, or, or even, or even that, I mean, yes, there is an element of care, but I think he really is stressing that natural self-ownership. So that black woman who, you know, has a right to the fruits of her own labor. I mean, he gives the, the sort of Lockean natural rights uh, argument there, right? She's my equal and the equal of all others because we are, we, we, we are, we have this self-ownership. Uh, so that it, it, it is individual natural rights. And I think also the same when he gets to those girls. So yes, he is trying to appeal to the men in the audience. Dred Scott is like you, he's a father, he's got daughters, he cares about them. Uh, but what he says about those daughters is that they have a right to consent, right? It's their choice who they marry. So again, he stresses that sort of individual natural rights argument. So I, really dethroning the fathers, then? Uh, um, well, yes, to the extent that the natural right teaching, yeah, upon the age of adulthood or whatever, yeah, you, you come into your own. So you might say he's playing both sides a little bit because he's wanting them to... You want to care. Care, care, but it doesn't mean ownership. And that's why I think it's okay when he says, I need not have her for right. either. In other words, you don't, you don't own your wife either. But then you think that, that was a bit tendentious to say, I don't need to have anything to do with her. When in fact, if I didn't want to have anything to do with her, I'd follow Judge Douglas and say, let them, let the whites decide in these places. And if the blacks want to do something about it, let them do it. It's not my fight. Why would I care? By saying I don't have to have anything to do with her, that invalidates the sense no, of... No, he doesn't say I don't have, to, have to have anything to do with her. He says I need not have her in either of these two capacities slave or wife but I think he is saying you know really as 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 a community of rights bearing people we are sort of allowed to go our own way but yet there can be this membership membership community in that way so I, I do think he is yeah I mean that he maybe is thinking about what what would be necessary to establish a kind of friendship between the races Right. And it's certainly in thinking about what happens after the war, he's very much thinking about that question. Um, and Frederick Douglass is thinking about that question too. He's, he's really interesting on this. Uh, the speech, that, the oration that he gives in memory of Abraham Lincoln, where he begins with kind of saying, we have to prove ourselves as men. Right? Before you can have brotherhood, there has to be a sort of manliness. Uh, and so I, I think that's how Douglas tr tries to bring those things together. There is that kind of Lockean, I mean, by manliness he really means this sort of Lockean, you know, presentation of yourself as a self, uh, and that only on that basis can you con construct a, com a community. I thought you were going to say as a man, not as a self. Uh, well, interestingly, by uh, Douglas seems to include women in in manliness, uh -huh. as Harvey does sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, choosing my words carefully, since I now know that uh, they may end up engraved on a stone wall. <laughs> uh, would you would you say that Frederick, uh, since you've been a great student of these two men, uh, would you say that uh, Frederick Douglass was the equal of Lincoln? Hmm. Well, they're my two favorite guys from the 19th century, for sure. <coughs> uh, 
You, you were gonna make me answer that? No. <laughs> um, I, I really like Frederick Douglass, um, but I, I think that Lincoln is the comprehensive statesman. And I think that Douglass, in his oration in memory of Abraham Lincoln, sort of recognizes the comprehensive statesmanship of Lincoln and understands that in a certain way it, it was superior to Douglass's own statesmanship, which was always partial. And he sort of admits its partiality. He says, I always occupied the genuine abolition ground, right? Douglas thought of himself as the friend of the slave. Uh, whereas Lincoln has to somehow address the whole, uh, the whole nation. Uh, and in addressing the whole nation, Lincoln eventually comes to act for the slave as well. Right? In other words, he uh, eventually, in order to save the Union, he accomplishes abolition. But for Lincoln, that cause of abolition is always subordinate to the cause of union. Couldn't you say, so, or somebody might say, that that was a difference in situation or opportunity? That, that, uh, that we, uh, that, that, oh, that Lincoln uh, had that? Uh, that Douglas never had the yeah. opportunity that, to, to act to, uh, in that. To act comprehensively. Yeah. yeah. No, and, 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 and so, I mean, in a way, that speech in oration of Lincoln, in recognizing Lincoln's comprehensive statesmanship, maybe Douglas sh shows his understanding of it or that he, he, he could have done it had the, had the situation been different. But um, so, um, I don't know. I, I, what, I, I guess what, I think Lincoln is... What did Douglas think of uh, Lincoln? Do we have any? Ah, oh yeah, we have a lot of indication. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I'm sorry, the other way. What did, oh, we, what did Lincoln, Lincoln think, think, of what did Lincoln uh, think of Douglas? Yeah, we don't have as much evidence there um, because Douglas actually wrote about Lincoln and on a number of occasions. Uh, Lincoln never writes about Douglas, mm -hmm. but Lincoln invites him to the White House three times, mm -hmm. so they meet on those occasions. Uh, he is also present at the reception after the second inaugural. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a great story. Uh, Douglas is the first black man to ever be in the, in, in the White House and ever present at one of these receptions. Uh, but initially, the guards try to keep him out. They actually sort of toss him out a window, like a big kind of you know, full length <laughs> window, and he slips back in. And then somebody has to intervene and tell Lincoln that they're trying to keep Douglas out. Uh, and Lincoln overrides them and says, no, no, you know, let, the, <laughs> let, 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 let Mr. Douglas in. And he comes through the receiving line and you know, shakes hands. Uh, and Lincoln uh, says to him, um, I mean, we have this only from Douglas, but that he tells him that his opinion is the one opinion in the country that he wants to hear, and he says, what did you think of it? In other words, what did you, Frederick Douglass, think of the second inaugural? And Douglass says, it was a sacred effort, Mr. President. Uh, and I still think that's probably the best description of the second inaugural, a sacred effort. And if you look at those two words, what was sacred about it and what was the effort, what was it trying to achieve, that that's sort of the best way, best way into the speech. So, um, yeah, I, I do think that Lincoln was uh, impressed with Douglas. I mean, everybody who ever met him was. Yeah, Greg? Oh, right here. Yeah. So, um, and it, very, very fine uh, set of thoughts there. Uh, I did have a conversation uh, recently with a pacifist uh, friend of mine, a woman who wondered about Lincoln. And, um, you know, so you mentioned that Lincoln uh, was sensitive to public opinion and was very patient and recognized that uh, what might be right in principle may not be something that can be realized in the moment. But yet he did march the country off to the worst conflagration that our nation has ever had. Um, 
So what would you say to this woman? How do you justify his willingness to do that? Uh, yeah, I guess I would say I don't think he marches us off to it. Uh, I would put the blame other places, like with the secessionists, but uh, you know, who, who, in response to a perfectly constitutional election, um, decided to invalidate that election by by seceding, um, an act of nullification. Um, well, they were sanctuary cities, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we see that the cause of nullification has not, uh, you know, has not gone away. Uh, for Lincoln, the war had to be fought uh, for the preservation of the possibility of free government. Uh, I think he was absolutely serious about this. We are engaged in a great test, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. I, he, he said the central idea of secession was, 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 was anarchy, and you can't admit that principle. It was, it was essential that the, that the war be fought. Um, the, in, in, in a way, it goes to the very meaning of self-government. What, what does it mean when you, when you form this political community? You uh, agree to abide by the determinations of the majority, even if you don't share in that, uh, in that opinion. Uh, it, it's about the relationship between ballots and bullets. Uh, Lincoln's got that great passage where he says, you know, once you've agreed to be bound by ballots, you, you don't have recourse to bullets any longer. Your only recourse is to ballots again at the next balloting. Uh, and he pleads with the South in the first inaugural, uh, you know, I'm only here for four short years. Can't you wait me out? <laughs> uh, you know. Of course, it, the Czech Republic and Slovenia did divide. Lots yeah, well, you know, like, I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln says, I mean, there certainly is a right of revolution. Uh, so a justified revolution, yes. But he says in this case, secession is not an instance of the right of revolution. And they themselves didn't present it that way. They argued they had a constitutional right of secession. And Lincoln says there's no constitutional right of secession. There's no suicide clause in any, in any, uh, any government in the world. Um, so, you know, if this is a revolution, tell us what constitutional rights of yours has been, have been violated. And there are no constitutional rights of the South that have been violated. And Lincoln makes clear he has no intention to violate any of them. He says, I'm going to enforce the fugitive slave law. It's an obnoxious duty, but it's a constitutional duty. And I intend to enforce it. I, I suspect I wouldn't persuade your pacifist friend. But uh, I'm hoping to persuade no, I, you. I, I that I'm argument hoping to persuade you. Yes, uh, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Greg, I think had a question. Uh, side note, I think, um, ironically, Douglas himself was a product of amalgamation. His father was yes. right. Yes, usually yeah. thought to be his first master. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the question of contemporary relevance, it seems like the insinuation of your talk is that credential statesmanship sometimes is undermined, or it requires not moral outrage, but a yeah. affirmation of a moral principle couched in prudent terms that accepts existing opinion and nudges it in a particular direction. And I'm wondering in terms of uh, today's discussion of race relations, uh, what, what, we can, what we can learn from Lincoln about the strengths and limits of pure moral outrage and promoting racial progress, if he offers any lessons yeah. at all. Uh, yeah, I, that, that's, that's nice. I, yeah, moral principle without moral outrage. It's not a combination you see very often. Yeah. And you certainly don't see it today. Uh, but you didn't see a lot of it then either. I mean, what was the language like on both sides, right? You got these abolitionists, uh, you know, the pol you know, vi vituperative. I mean, incredibly vituperative uh, denunciations of of Southerners, and then on the other side, the you know, extreme extreme rhetoric of Calhoun and company. So there weren't many people speaking in the way that 
that Lincoln was. Um, and in many ways, it wasn't notably <coughs> successful either. <laughs> right? I mean, every, every speech he gives doesn't succeed. Uh, you know, the first inaugural, he pleads with them. <laughs> They don't, they don't hear of it. The second inaugural, malice or son with charity towards all, not what happened in Reconstruction. Uh, so do we need more Lincolnian rhetoric today? When we yeah, but it probably won't be any, it won't be no any one. more successful, yeah. but we'll have something to read 200 years from now if there were, <laughs> if there were more of it, yeah. Alberto and then, well, first of all, I would like to say that what you said regarding secession made me think that the current incumbent prime minister in Spain, Jan uh, is following Lincoln's uh, uh, example, basically, regarding Catalonia. But this, this is not my <laughs> question. My question is regarding your interpretation of the um, quote from the Dred Scott speech when uh, Lincoln talks about the black woman and he says in some respects she certainly is not my equal but in her natural right uh, she is my equal and equal of all others. So you, you said that your interpretation is that here Lincoln is uh, uh, speaking in his own name, but it seems to me that this reference to natural right and to equality in terms of right um, should lead, lead us to think that he may uh, have spoken as one of the men created equals of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, it seems to me that this reference is at least possible. Uh, and I'm saying this also because it seems to me that his interpretation of equality in terms, in, in a purely formal manner, equality in the rights is compatible with this kind of interpretation. Because if you interpret equality just in a formal manner, in terms of equal rights, rights understood as freedom, liberty, uh, the only thing you cannot tolerate is uh, legal discrimination, so slavery, but you have a lot of room for other types of discrimination, social discrimination, even, even racism to some extent. So... Yeah, Can, do, do you have the page number there? The, are you looking in the, in the text? The paper is 21. From, I think it is the threat Scott. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me just. Um, he made a, a joke about the fact that nobody except some Harvard professor including are men who are equal to Lincoln. So then you, 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 you interpret this passage in, in, in along those lines. Yeah, let me, let me see if I understand what you're saying. I mean, when, when you. Went back to the declaration. I mean, are, are you agreeing so that, that he is saying that women are equal to men in their natural rights? Not certainly. Yeah. He's equal. He may have said that arguing as one of the men created equal of the declaration. Right, that she's, she's within that, right? She's included in all men. All men means all human beings. So that wouldn't be his point of view, as far as uh, uh, as far as I understand here. I mean, this no, I, I, I think he's interpretation is still possible. That that's my question. Whether you think that this interpretation is possible, or, or no? I, I I mean, I I think he's saying emphatically that all men means all human beings. And his representative example of a person entitled to natural rights is a black woman. So she is include. She is. It, it, it is inclusive. It's all human beings. So but on your other point about yeah. So he's would, already. How would he say sorry? Yeah. That this woman is certainly not his equal. Yes, not his equal. Remember, he's already given some ways uh, in which one is not equal. People are different colors. So 
if equal means same, right, we're not the same color, but that difference may be, may or may not be politically relevant. Uh, there's a matter of intellect. Uh, his intellect may be superior to her intellect, uh, either by nature or because of uh, access to education. But for Lincoln, as for Jefferson, differences in, in intelligence are not an entitlement to rule. Right? Jefferson says, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton is my superior in intellect, but he's not my lord and master. Right? That's, not a, that's, not a, that's not a title to rule. Uh, so I, I actually think, I mean, in, in the paper, in the longer paper, I gave that quote from Frederick Douglass to indicate, I think, what, what Lincoln might mean by saying natural rights. And this does mean something for, it's not just formal, it, it affects how people live. So if I can read what Douglas says here, uh, Frederick Douglass, um, what I ask for the Negro is not benevolence, not pity, not sympathy, but simply justice. The American people have always been anxious to know what they shall do with us. I've had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us. <laughs> You're doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us. All I ask is, give the Negro a chance to stand on his own legs. Let him alone, right? I need not have her for a slave or a, or a, or a wife. I can just let her alone. Douglas says, let him alone. If you see him on his way to school, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going to the dinner table at a hotel, let him alone. If you see him going to the ballot box, let him alone. Don't disturb him. If you see him going into a workshop, let him alone. Your interference is doing him a positive injury. That's interesting, because there I think Douglas indicates there will be a role for government. Government will have to guarantee access to the hotel, access to the school, access to the ballot box. Right. So there is a role for government, but it is to just sort of, you know, make sure that there isn't discrimination in access to those those places. So I I guess I would see Lincoln's probably post-war policy going in that kind of that kind of direction with respect to both blacks and women. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so you talked about how um, Lincoln uh, took advantage of white, you know, discussed with Negroes to, you know, uh, make a case against slavery. But I guess I was under the impression that it was a lot easier for him to spin white prejudice against blacks into electoral gold for Republicans just because what he was selling was we're going to keep slavery and also effectively keep blacks out of the territories and keep the territories for whites, whites living in the existing United States as well as whites coming in from Europe. So he was, you know, he had that to offer. I mean, he never campaigned on starting a war. He never campaigned no, yeah. uh, freeing slaves. So I'm wondering, like, I mean, the what, what you said about his thinking and his speeches, is it mostly to connect us, you know, living in this time to his thinking, or is it also supposed to mean that people living at that time found him convincing? Because that's what yeah. that's about herself. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, well, remember, it's, it's Stephen Douglas who is virulently and explicitly racist. Right? So he has all of those votes. Uh, it seems to me that, because remember, what, what, what Douglas and the Democrats are doing is saying that the Republicans are just like the abolitionists. And in fact, they always called them the black Republicans. <laughs> and they always talked about Fred Douglas, who was not a Republican, but the Democrats were always making that linkage between the Republicans and the abolitionists. So Lincoln has to sort of break that connection in the public mind. He has to, and, and to do that, he has to say certain things that bring him closer to Douglas and even Douglas's racism, right? There's a natural disgust in the minds of all, that, those, kinds of, those kinds of comments. At the same time, though, I think he is aware that this racism is what is standing in the way of the anti-slavery cause. 
and he is on board with the anti-slavery cause. He's not an immediate emancipationist the way the abolitionists are, but he is determined to keep slavery out of the, the, the territories. Not just because he wants those territories for free white people, but because he is anti-slavery. And if slavery spreads, then slavery becomes fixed permanently uh, within the nation. Uh, so so he, he is in a very difficult rhetorical position. He, he does have to say certain things that accommodate that racism, the racism of the time. But he doesn't want to do it in a way that will ingrain it or that will, will you know, make it worse. He's, he's accommodating it, but transforming it, transcending it, trying to shift it, trying to get people to set it aside so that they can realize that, that they, they really do despise slavery and they think slavery is wrong and the nation has to do something about it. Believe he's well, he's successful enough that, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if the Democratic Party hadn't split in, the, in 1860, Lincoln wouldn't have won. But, yeah, he's, he's successful enough. <laughs> One quick question to add. Uh, I'm sort of seeing parallels 1857 and today. Is the Democratic Party splitting in 1857 where they didn't want people like Stephen Douglas who would compromise and do votes and change. There was a group in the Democratic Party that was holding on to a snapshot of America and they were hoping that Lincoln would win because then they would secede and, and hold on to what their picture of the United States was. And I kind of see that the rise of Donald Trump was to look at a snapshot of what they thought America should be, and they were seeing it drift, you know, into things of gay marriage and transgender and other things that they weren't prepared to move the country towards. So do you see them both holding on to those snapshots? Uh, thanks. Are you going to answer gonna, that for I, me? I'm going to, no, I'm going to excuse the, uh, <laughs> we've got to vacate the room, uh, but uh, maybe you can uh, pursue this uh, Party afterwards. splits. And, uh, you, you, yeah. the, the fracturing of a party. Yeah. Thanks very much, Diana.